Hi, I'm MJ Hecox, and I'm here at Leopold's where we pair wine with books. So when most people think of premium wine, Lebanon doesn't necessarily spring to mind. But this area of the world has an incredible winemaking tradition dating back to 6000 BC when the Phoenicians were planting grapevines. We particularly appreciate this bottle from Chateau Mouzard, three generations of winemakers in this family here. Uh, the bottle is named Hochard, and we chose it because it's a Grenache blend. Grenache goes beautifully with lamb, lamb tagine, or other big, bold flavored dishes. And this is why we chose it. When you pop the bottle, you may get some notes of lavender on the nose. We think that's going to pair beautifully with the mint that's on top of these meatballs. On the palate, You've got bright red raspberry, summer strawberry, super ripe poppy flavors that are going to pair in a really nice way with the tomato sauce with this dish. This wine is definitely an insider's wine. It's a Somme favorite, Chateau Moussard in particular. So we're excited to share it and we think you'll enjoy it. Hey folks, uh, my name is Travis and I wanted to uh, introduce you to Provision, a new specialty market that we opened up at the Pasquals on East Washington Avenue. Um, so we're a place that you can pick up some of your Pasquals favorites, salsas, chips, dips, sauces, prepared meal kits, um, and other prepared foods, um, as well as grocery items to complete your taco night or uh, an Italian dinner, pastas, pasta sauces, and of course spirits, margarita supplies, um, craft beer, local imported, um, put together some gift sets for uh, holiday time, uh, local treats from folks like Gail Ambrosius and Nutcrack, yeah, we're uh, just hoping to become a nice neighborhood spot um, when you're stopping in for a meal or live in the neighborhood and need something to bring to a dinner party or just uh, finish Taco Tuesday. So we hope to see you soon. With the Cap Times and welcome to the St. Patrick's Day edition of Cooking with the Cap Times. We're so excited to have you watching from home tonight and we have an in-person audience again. <laughs> if you're interested in um, joining us in person at future events, we encourage you to become a Cap Times member. They get first dibs at coming or follow us on Instagram at Cap Times Madison. We do give away some take, uh, in person passes, I guess, there. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Lindsay Christians and our chef in one second. Um, you just saw some sponsor messages from Provision Market, our presenting sponsor. And you also saw, uh, saw a message from our new sponsor, Leopold's Books Bar Cafe. So excited to have them here. They're going to be featuring different wines every month that they choose to pair with the dish being made. So great. We love wine. Uh, <laughs> we are celebrating a milestone tonight. Cooking with the Cap Times has surpassed over 100,000 views. So exciting. And where we're coming to you live tonight is Kessenix, the Innovation Center Kitchen in Madison, Wisconsin. They are our official kitchen sponsor. You can shop like a chef because Kessenix is open to the public here in Madison. So we welcome you. Go to their website to get some more information and check out their open hours to the public. We hope you stop by. Uh, and we want to encourage you again, um, uh, we want to thank all our Cap Times members who are tuning in from home. If you'd like to learn about becoming a Cap Times member, you can give any amount to support our newsroom. And specifically, if you like cooking with the Cap Times, chip in a little, keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> we love you for doing that. Um, you can go to membership.captimes.com and I will post some of these links in the chat of the Zoom. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Lindsay Christians, <laughs> uh, one of Wisconsin's foremost food writers and critics and author and all of the things and our chef. So thank you so much, you guys. Thank you, Chelsea. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Patrick, for oh, being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start out with just asking you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are, where you work, and why you chose the recipe that you chose tonight. I am Patrick O'Halloran. I'm the head chef at Lombardino's Restaurant in Madison on the near west side. 
I am also applause. A, yeah, yeah, we like that. <laughs> Woo! I'm a I'm a partner in another business, the Tipsy Cow. There's two locations: one on the Capitol Square on King Street, and one in Sun Prairie. And then I have a new business that's a family business that we started during COVID. I know everyone hates pivots, but this is what we did. <laughs> we have a blended family business called the Deliciouser, and we're blending spices. And our blended family is my soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Ann Minson, my wife, Michelle Oyamata, and my ex-wife, Marcia Castro. So it's truly a blended family business. Um, and we're going to be cooking with some Deliciouser spices tonight. And I'm going to be making some Italian food because that's what I'm mostly known for. So we're going to use some, a lot of local ingredients. We're going to have a spiritless cocktail for St. Patrick's Day. Marsha is over there making one with spirits for those, those who <laughs> imbibe. Head, yes. um, and we are going to just have a great time here cooking some uh, Italian food with Deliciouser spices. I love it. And we came up with the name Deliciouser because I have had so many cooks in the 22 years I've been in Lombardino's. And I would always tell them, you know, anyone can make food delicious. We can make it delicious, sir. So, <laughs> it, so and I've had pushback from cooks. That's not a real word. <laughs> That's not a word. So I made it my point of this business to make that a real word. Language so. is a social construct, <laughs> yeah. right? And we are constructing it. So, so we make the rules. Yeah, awesome. so we're going to make some food delicious here tonight. I love that. I love that. These spices are gorgeous, by the way. They're sort of lined up here all along our bar, and every single one looks different. I think they're all different spices. They're beautiful. Yeah, so. they're very unique, and what we're learning is we have some interesting names on a lot of them. People love them. They look beautiful, but they need a little instruction on how to use them. So mm -hmm. in the future, soon, we'll be announcing some things with Deliciouser where we're going to be doing cooking classes and getting out there and showing people how to use our products. Yeah, that's great. So that's really cool. Um, I'm going to start out with this quick cocktail. Love it. Um, and it's been about 10 years ago, roughly, that I stopped drinking, which was a really good move for me. Um, <laughs> in the restaurant business, that is a, that's a big deal. Um, so I came up with a spiritless version of the Pimzo O'Halloran. The Pimzo Halloran was invented uh, maybe 23 years ago when I was working at Opus Lounge. It was my first job here in Madison after I came from Milwaukee, and I was with Shinji Muramoto. The two of us were in this little basement kitchen, and we came up with this Pimz that had ginger beer, and it had uh, a little bit of Irish whiskey. And I, over the years, kind of thought I invented it, but it comes to my attention that Marcia Castro really invented it, <laughs> so my ex-wife. So she's making the real deal over there. So it's not even Irish. It's made by Marcia, who's Mexican. <laughs> I, I love that. The th one of the things I really liked about this cocktail, this non-alcoholic cocktail, is that it, it, it does have, like, you know, some cucumbers in there. It's got lime, right? It's got all these like, kind of lovely yeah. herby vegetal flavors, but, but it's... Oftentimes when you're looking to make a non-alcoholic cocktail interesting, yeah. right? You mm -hmm. end up having to like make a syrup yeah. or steep something or <laughs> mu like muddle stuff. Like there's all this stuff because you have to work a little harder sometimes with non-alcoholic stuff to make it more than like soda with juice or Here's whatever. The syrup. So in this case, I'm using yeah. just a little bit of pomegranate molasses. So that's going to add a little body to this with the pomegranate juice. And then I really like this uh, ginger beer that's really strong. And the tonic water actually gives it that uh, flavor of real adult cocktail. Nice. So you're yeah. not getting a kitty cocktail here. And then this gets mixed up with fresh mint and cucumbers. There's limes. I just looked over for all of my mise en place, all my things, and they stole them. They're over there making it. <laughs> <laughs> Where's all my stuff? <laughs> you yep, saw the right. look, Ooh. yeah. So this one. Just has a little bit of mint. Ice, the beauty ice. of this cocktail is to get a little bit of that cucumber right up next to your nose when you take a swig. We need some so, more ice? We good? I think we're good. All so right. I just mix that up. Yeah, we're good. And we'll, get, we'll let a few people try this. The key is to get something that is similar to an alcoholic drink, but not so heavy. A lot of uh, non-alcoholic drinks Ooh. have juices or syrups that become really heavy. So we'll let some people try the non-alcoholic version and then Marsh is whipping up the alcoholic version so this is the boozy one I'm just I'm just gonna try I'm just gonna sample it yeah <laughs> I'll give it a poison check as my mother would say <laughs> mm. while you're sampling 
So that's the one with ginger and Ooh. Irish whiskey and Pims. Yeah, the ginger really comes through. I think she's actually making it with brandy. Is she? Because, you know, we make We're in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Wisconsin. I, so I love that you use the pomegranate molasses in that cocktail in part because I love using pantry ingredients in cocktails in general. Yeah. But also I feel like the Ottolenghi craze from like, uh -huh. what, 10 years ago? Everybody bought pomegranate molasses when like everyone was cooking out of Ottolenghi's, like especially those early couple cookbooks, like Ottolenghi, well, Plenty, yeah. and Jerusalem. And so, yeah, I, I feel like that's something now that I will always oh, have yeah. in my, my pantry. And, uh, and it's I took nice a trip a few years ago to Israel. And yeah. I, some of the best food I've ever had I went with my parents. When the first thing my mother said on the way there, I'm not eating hummus. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like hummus. And uh, so we traipsed all over mm. Israel and she ate hummus. I was it's, a, say. It's, a, it's at every meal. So. And wasn't the delicious are born in the basement of Bunkies? Yeah, I mean, it you is, gotta yeah. eat hummus there. And, and, and Teresa and Rashid make some great hummus, and they. It's so good. They uh, always make sure that my mom has some when yeah. she's in town. <laughs> so I'm gonna start making my meatballs, and um, I can talk a little bit about this. This is how we do them at Lombardino's, and this is part of cucina povera, poor food from southern Italy. Mm -hmm. So um, what they do in Italy is they use a lot of bread and a lot of cheese in the meatballs. We're gonna make ours with a combination of sausage from Frabonis, and we have some um, lamb from Pin Oak Ridge Farm in Delavan, so local lamb and sausage. And I'm gonna get that in a big bowl. I have to run over to the cooler and get Chef, that. We do have our first question. We do? Well, you run to the cooler. Um, why do you, from Tom, why do you use I'm English muffins for the Panade? I'm sorry, that's, I'm just, uh, well, uh, instead of some other kind of bread. Is that, well, did I say it right? Well, yeah, the um, English muffins, this is something I researched when we opened Lombardino's in 2000. We took it over, it's been there 70 years. So 70 we've years, had this it, year, 70 yeah, years, yeah. And we've had it for 22 years. Um, and what we did was figure, you know, we had to move the menu a little bit from what it was. Yeah. You know, an old Italian spaghetti house, red sauce joint, but we had to stick with some of the classics. So we called for Boney's and we contacted them to get the sausage. Uh, Barbara for Boney said, she remembers me calling and saying, oh, another restaurant, he's gonna buy sausage from us, this never works. 20 years later, I think we've bought 190,000 pounds of sausage from oh, Lord, God. Why does it? Why does she say it never works? <laughs> because people contact her all the time and then they don't follow through with buying. Oh. They find it cheaper somewhere else or a commodity sausage, but we've been loyal to Forbonis for so many years. Um, and back to the question about the English muffin, when I was researching and feeling, we have to have meatballs in this opening menu, um, I looked at a million recipes and I found that the American meatball, when Italians came here, they added so much more meat and they were heavy and dense. Yeah. And then I found someone who's doing this, uh, soaking English muffins in milk and adding a ton of bread and a ton of cheese made a much lighter meatball. So even though you feel like this is filler, it's a better texture. Yeah, and um, I feel like adding cheese does yeah. not immediately translate to lighter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know? it does. So I, I soak these briefly in a little bit of whole milk from Sassy Cow. Um, and then I mix this in just real gently with uh, equal parts. So I have a pound of the Pin Oak Ridge lamb, and then I have a pound of Fraboni sweet sausage. And then to really make this thing pop, I'm going to use some of our bomba, which is our southern Italian mix. Can smell that. It's got a little right red wine Ooh. vinegar powder, lots of Calabrese chilies. As the chili comes through, And there's through, some yeah. toasted fennel, there's garlic in there, and we want two tablespoons of that kind of mixed in here. And these spices are really beautiful, and they're meant to be used. They're meant to be cooked with. They're not just to decorate your I was gonna uh, see, is there citrus in there, cabinet. but it must be the vinegar. Yeah, it's a vinegar powder. Yeah. So that kind of gives it a little bit of a pop. And then, like I said, a little bit of cheese, Pecorino Romano, so it's almost equal parts meat of each meat and cheese. Um, and then in addition, we're gonna add a couple of eggs that'll beat up here. I feel like when I'm adding this much of a cheese grated like that, that's when I break out the food processor and I use oh, that yeah. rotating blade just to go really fast. Oh, kinda, got a shell in there. But it's not too devastating, we'll get it out. <laughs> um, so yeah, we would, I, I use the food processor all the time. We use Montemore, which is a yes. really good cheese from I Sartori. love Montemore. It has almost like a cheddar-y quality yeah, to it. it's like cheddar and love Parmesan it. had a baby. Yes, exactly. And yeah. we, we put it in the food processor and it crumbles beautifully. So, so good. That really is like one, if I'm doing cheese boards, Montemore is always gone, just yeah, gone. that's a great cheese. Yeah. We use that quite a bit. It's on the menu all the time at Lombardino's. So I have my bomba in there, I have my cheese, 
cheese, I'm gonna put just a little bit of salt. It doesn't need much because of all this Pecorino Romano. Right, So that's yeah. a, the uh, sheep's milk grating cheese from Southern Italy, and that one is really, really salty. So we have all of our ingredients in there. I'm gonna put on some more gloves and we'll do some mixing. I like the, oh, sorry, sorry. Two questions are coming in hot. Right. Um, do you want to remind people where uh, first? Do you want to remind them where to get the delicious sir blends? Okay, from the deliciouser.com. We're also available at Brennan's on the far west side, Orange Tree Imports. We're at the Seafood Center, uh, Burke and Benham on Monroe Street. Um, and just today, we were accepted by Metcalf's at Hilda. Oh, that's cool. And yeah. there's a lot, some potential that we will also go into the Wauwatosa Metcalfs. So um, they're very interested in what we're doing. So Metcalfs, we're really happy. if watching, we'd love to have you <laughs> as a sponsor. Um. Also, all of these ingredients that you see, uh, most of them are coming from Metcalfs. Oh, <laughs> nice. Perfect. Um, yeah. Thanks for that question, Chris. I'll post the link to the website in the chat. One more quick question. Oh, Chris sure. said, yeah. Oh, uh, one more question. Uh, Peggy asked, is there any necessity in using a metal bowl to mix? No, uh, I don't think so. You could use a wooden bowl just as well, or a bamboo or whatever you have. Um, but just generally in restaurant kitchens, this is what we have, giant bowls. And I came to the showroom kitchen here today, and that's what they have. Nice. So this is what I'm using. So you mentioned in the recipe that you don't want to like squeeze the meatballs really tightly yeah. like when you're making them, but you're, but you're using a little bit of just A little bit of, like, yeah. yeah. To We're trying to together. bring it all together, but it's still a little bit crumbly. You know, there's going to be big chunks of cheese, big chunks of bread in there. Yeah. Um, but like I said, that gives it a little bit of lighter texture. So, and then this dish is great to make for a crowd. It's also great the next day. I have another yeah. batch ready in the back, um, you know, through the magic of television. Those were made two days Kitchen ago. Kitchen magic. really delicious. So, I love um, it. So I have my little mixture right here. I'm just going to pop it right out here and then we'll roll some meatballs. I had a couple folks ask if you could substitute for the lamb. I know my mother doesn't eat lamb because it's a baby or something. <laughs> uh, she, like, she, she, she eats most things, but like not veal and not lamb because they're small, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, we had the question and you could do it with turkey, you could do it with yeah. chicken, beef. Pork, anything. Yeah. Um, right now at the restaurant we have a veal meatball, speaking yeah. of babies, so. Um, it's a veal and, veal <laughs> and pork. Delicious baby. That's made with uh, <laughs> Parmigiano-Reggiano and they have sage and black truffle puree. No, yeah. We serve that in that's a, a sauce of braised cabbage and caramelized right onions Ooh. and black truffles and cream. So that's a real heavy, like kind of alpine version of a meatball. Yeah, but putting Whereas black these truffle are very puree salt. in there is a great way to like get the flavor in there and oh, really yeah. use it, yeah. These Mike are more had a good of a question southern. about the lamb. Yeah. Where do you get the lamb? Pin Oak Ridge Farms in Delavan, Wisconsin, and you buy it at Metcalf's. <laughs> Metcalf's in Delavan, yeah. Wisconsin. I've seen Pin Oak Ridge like in most, in, in most groceries around yeah. here. It's pretty well available, I think. Yeah, they, we buy all of our lamb from there. Um, we have a lamb shoulder that we're doing with a pappardelle pasta right now that's yeah. on the menu. Um, so I like this combination of the pecorino cheese, the sheep's milk cheese, with the lamb. It's a great combination. Yeah. So, so like I said, I don't want to beat these up. I'm just kind of pulling them until they come together. Kind of like rustic. Cookies. It's rustic. Like my, uh, I have a pizza maker, Bernie, and she says, rustico, everything's rustico. <laughs> I said, Is it, are the pizzas rustic? Always. Uh, rustic. <laughs> rustico. We have um, Dottie. I think, Patrick, do you know Dottie? These meatballs rock, seriously. <laughs> I made the recipe last night, and this is true Lumbo's. Thanks, nice. Patrick. <laughs> Love your fan, Dottie. I know Dottie, thank you. Um, that was beautiful. I really appreciate that she said Lumbo's. I overheard a woman at the bar once saying Lombies. I'm like, it's Lombo's. It just didn't oh, sit man. right. <laughs> That's really funny. But yeah, yeah, these are, these are on the menu occasionally. So this is the... Uh, this is probably the hardest part of the whole thing, forming the meatballs. Um, how is the cocktail, all right? Delicious. Marcia oh, did okay. yeah. It's it's and lovely. I hope the non-alcoholic one, you know, it's a nice it's, I really spritz. like the non-alcoholic one. I like the pomegranate in it. It's really nice. It's really just it's fresh pretty. and fruity. And yeah. it's nice to have an option, you know? It's <laughs> delicious there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> mm. So these, depending on what size you make, you know, they're going to take 10 to 15 minutes in the oven. and. Um, Marsha likes them small, I like them big, so I was gonna say, we, no yeah. one ever agrees on the size of the meatball. Um, and she said, I don't eat lamb, and then she ate like 10 of them, she loved them. <laughs> there she is over there, she Michelle and Marsha. <laughs> 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 and Marsha's a partner at the Old Fashioned downtown. We started that at what, 20, 
2005. 2005. Yeah. We're really getting old. <laughs> you were also a founder of Madison Originals. I didn't realize yeah. that too. Yeah, Marsh and I did yeah. that together. We took a trip to yeah. Kansas City and we came across Kansas City Originals and then we brought the idea back mm -hmm. to Madison. And then I remember we did a lot of things with Madison Magazine. I'm gonna put these in the oven quick. Um, the yeah. Madison Food and Wine Show being one. Yeah. Um, we spent a lot of time with the dueling chefs and then was in some meetings um, and we were kind of instrumental in starting Restaurant Week, too. That was yes. an idea that we had at a meeting. There she is. You. you got me. I'm like right. Van White, just with the oven. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ten minutes. Okay. So now we're going to make our mezzo giorno gravy. So mezzo giorno is another one of our spice blends, which is uh, southern Italian. The mezzo giorno means midday. The midday sun is what uh, you think of south of Rome, between yeah. Rome and Sicily. Um, and I have some, speaking of north of Rome, some really good Tuscan olive oil. And we're gonna do this gravy and then we'll just let those meatballs kind of roast until they get caramelized and a little bit of the fat will kind of expel and then we'll finish them in the sauce. Oh, nice, okay. So here, for the mirepoix on here, which is carrot, celery, onion, um, I'm going to add some fresh fennel to this. Oh, nice. Okay. I really love the flavor of fennel. It's cut really small. Yeah. I just diced that all up. And this we just want to sweat it. Yeah. This is why I tell people, like, if you're going to cook along, as much as you can start ahead, start ahead. Yeah. <laughs> because it goes quick once we're here. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what kind of olive oil do you recommend? Do you use different olive oils for different purposes? Yeah. Questions mainly, about different olive oils for different purposes. We use different regional olive oils. So a Tuscan oil generally will be grassy and really peppery on the finish, and it's great with grilled meats. Um, and then we use a Ligurian oil, which is fruity. Um, and we li like that one with seafood. So those are the two regions we usually lean towards. So I've also worked with some Sicilian oils that almost taste like uh, tomato crossed with olive oil. So it's really a regional thing, but we try to use strictly Italian oil. Where do you get it? Uh, we have uh, different companies that we buy from. This one actually comes from some friends of mine, Deborah and Terry Hart. They go to Italy and help pick the olives every year, and then he imports pallets of this and sells it out of his garage on the west side. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I'm gonna add just a little base seasoning. Um, People at home are Googling Deborah and Terry Hart trying yeah. to find him. <laughs> the, uh, when the pandemic hit, we had to close our restaurants just two years ago. And um, I couldn't sit still, so I started a YouTube channel called Cooking at Home with the Real Lombardinos. I think for 32 or 34 days in a row, we, wow. my wife and I filmed uh, our dinner and we put up videos. And we, neither one of us had any experience doing that. But the one comment that kept coming up on our YouTube channel is, where do you get this? So just Google it. It's the Atlas uh, <laughs> Pepper Mill. It's really cool. Yeah. It looks like a Turkish coffee. Maker. Yeah, it, yeah. They sell them in Greece and Turkey. But it's funny that it that was the one thing everyone wanted to know. Where do you get that? Yeah. Where is that? Um, Have you thought of putting together a cookbook to properly use these? Yes, that's that's one of my dreams to have that? my own cookbook. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> Well, so I know someone who likes to write those kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> so these, uh, this mirepoix here is sweating down really nicely. And then I'm going to add some thinly sliced garlic, two cloves. So thinly sliced, not minced. Is there a reason? I just like it thinly sliced. And then, you know, if you get a big chunk, you kind of eat around it. Oh. Uh, one of the things I don't like is burnt garlic. Yeah, oh, that, that's yes. like the one thing I cannot stand. And it's so easy to burn yeah. garlic. So oh that's goodness. why I start things, I get them sweating. We add garlic in all of our dishes. If you come to Lombardinas, we're cooking every dish is made to order. So every pasta is made to order and then we throw the garlic in until we can start to smell it. It releases its perfume. I can smell it now. And then right away we're in with the wine. Um, we're using two buck chuck because <laughs> according to the New York Times, once you add heat, it neutralizes the wine. It really doesn't matter, and yeah. And so you just a fruity red wine, a Chianti or something of that nature. We're going to crank our heat up as high as we can go now. And we want to reduce the wine just a little bit, and then we'll get some tomatoes in here. Um, the only time I do wine that I'm like, that I, w like if I wouldn't drink it, if it's I'm using the entire bottle, uh -huh. Because usually it calls for how much did you just use? Like a cup? Usually, yeah, a cup you gotta drink the rest. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm usually something like something eh. decent, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
at our house, we're drinking mocktails and cooking with two buck chuck. See, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Do you ever freeze it? I've heard of that. Like, Never, no. Like putting it in ice cube trays? Like, I, have you ever heard of this? No. Like if then you, you pop out one at a time yep. as you need it, right? Yeah. yeah. Right, it doesn't last forever on your counter. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna let that kind of come down. Here I have brodo, which is the chicken sock we make at the restaurant. Italian brodo or broth. And we make this with chicken feet. And um, every week we butcher about 48 chickens. We get organic chickens and we do our chicken under a brick. So everything that we butcher doesn't go in the trash, it goes into the stock pot. So we always make fresh stock. I remember when I was in cooking school in the 90s, uh, chicken base was all the rage and <laughs> even, there were even some teachers in milwaukee that said you you'll never make stock in your career you'll base is the future and i said i, I want to make stock you know <laughs> our restaurant is kind of predicated on that so we make um usually about 15 gallons of stock a week and 15 gallons of our bullet may sauce a week is, is our general amount <laughs> so you you do change your menu seasonally i feel mm -hmm. like we've talked about that um yeah. are there are there things that you can sort of never remove from the oh, lombardino's yeah, menu for okay. sure um, we have the seasonals and then we have the signatures. Okay. So we have the Caesar salad and the house salad will never go, the calamari and the house pizza, but um, the spaghetti bolognese, the orecchiette with the sausage, rapini, and mm. brandy. Oh, I um, love that dish. And the uh, eggplant, uh. Neapolitan style eggplant. Those never leave. Even though some of it is heresy, I know. Um, I once, I read not long ago the mayor of Bologna saying spaghetti bolognese is not a thing. It's tagliatelle with ragu. And then I posted that and said, my whole life has been based on a lie. <laughs> um, and, the, and I watched the show and they said, well, where does spaghetti bolognese come from? And this Italian chef said, the Americans. <laughs> That's where it comes from. So uh, spaghetti bolognese will never leave at Lombardino's. Now I'm going to bring, I have my broth up to a boil there. I'm going to take two cans of these crushed tomatoes. So these are grown in um, California, Bianca di Napoli. Di Napoli is the farmer. Bianca is a pizza maker. Chris Bia or Bianco. Bianco from uh, oh, uh, he has the pizzeria super Bianco famous pizzeria. He got like pizza lung or something like that. I oh, really? read. Yeah, ah. because he was around a charcoal oven like all the yeah, time. Yeah, all the time. Oven. Not charcoal, so, but, but well, they partnered up on these uh, organic. It's really cool. Tomatoes. That, that's like chef power when it's like I'm gonna get my own. My own brand. Of mm -hmm. <laughs> So this Ooh. is kind of how you would call, woo, now we're cooking. <laughs> there we go. Let's go down a little bit. So we want to just simmer. This is like what you'd see in Italian American cooking, Sunday gravy. Yeah. So you would simmer this all day, and then you would also put in here some short ribs, some sausages, some pork necks, something like that, and you can let this go for three hours till all the meat's tender. And that's kind of the idea of what I wanted to show you guys today. Just really low heat. Yeah, right? yeah, low heat. But the fact that meatballs in Italy, they don't go with spaghetti. They're their own thing, you know? So you eat meatballs as one course, and then you take the sauce and you eat it with pasta. So you have two courses out of Chef one meal. Chef Boyardee has just yeah. correct me. <laughs> <laughs> so the mezzo giorno gravy, I'm gonna take the mezzo giorno spice here. We're gonna add some of that. So this one has the all the herbs you think of with Southern Italy, basil, oregano, marjoram, fennel, garlic, there's um, bell pepper powder in there. There's um, garlic, I said onion. So everything you would think of with your classic Italian red sauce. So we're gonna stir that in. And then we just let this simmer. So can you talk a little bit more about the delicious -er processes? Like, are you getting in dried herbs and blending them? Are you drying herbs yourself? Like, how are you? Um, we are sourcing dried herbs and spices okay. um, from all over the world and we have probably at least a dozen different places we source from. Mm -hmm. One of our favorites is called Burlap and Barrel. Okay. Um, and they bring in things, they started off working for NGOs in Afghanistan, so they met the farmers and they bring this stuff in straight. Got Cumin okay. from Afghanistan, uh, all kinds of fennel seeds, all different pepper flakes from Turkey. So we're trying to source you know, the best sourcing we can find. Um, so we bring those things in and then I toast and grind by hand. And then Michelle jars by hand everything. Some of them she hates, some of them she likes. <laughs> some are harder than others. Um, but it's uh, really done in a very, this, the old school, slow kind of fashion. Um, and we just went to the fancy food show in Las Vegas a couple yes, weeks ago. Yeah, you were talking about and that. And we talked with other spice companies, and I showed a jar of my signature salt to this guy that owns this the, stuff is amazing, by the, the way. Spice is Lab. Yeah. And the Spice Lab is a 125,000 square foot factory. And he looked at this and said, 
this is a beautiful handmade product. He's like, I can't do that. Mm. I said, well, can you tell me about your grinding and toasting equipment? He said, I don't grind and toast. I buy in bulk, I mix, I add lots of sugar and salt. Those are your oh. friends. And then I have people put them in jars. So we're doing wow. it in a much more artisanal way yeah. where we're actually grinding and toasting everything. Patrick, are you working on anything with fennel? I know that's a favorite spice. Of your yeah, there's fennel seed in the meatballs, in the bomba, and in the, um, the mezzo giorno. We yeah. also have some um, Indian fennel in our vaduvan, which Ooh. is an Indian curry. So, um, yeah. I was wondering, do you come up with the mixes for particular dishes, or do you just come up with the mixes and then figure out what dish well. it would work? So just to repeat that question, she's asking if if you come up with a mix for a specific dish, or or if you if or if you're creating dishes based on creating yeah. dishes After based you, on the spice. It's yeah. kind of a mixture of both. Okay. Like we came up with a few things, and then we wanted to have a well-rounded product line. Uh, so we looked at all the other spice oh, yeah. companies in the country that we're inspired by, and globally. And I did a lot of research on the spice trade, um, which historically that's why people left Europe to go get spices. They were worth more than gold. Um, and there's a whole history of spice, but that's a whole other story of exploitation mm -hmm. that we don't want to get into today. But um, So I came up with certain things, like I knew the signature salt, I wanted a citrus and tarragon, kind of a French feel. Um, and then other things, because I've worked in Italian restaurants for 20 some years, we did some Italian things. And then I knew I wanted a curry and I wanted this Burberry, which is a spice I lo really love. So we tried to research how to make one uh, you know, That's we an find African spice blend. Yeah, yeah. And it's usually pretty spicy. Yeah, ours isn't as fiery, but it's really complex. Yeah, and I've looked at other really great spice companies, and they might have seven ingredients in theirs. Ours has twenty. I've seen so, recipes with like yeah. literally twenty mm -hmm. ingredients, in and we're sourcing yeah. from Ethiopian stores in Washington D.C., and they're sending us stuff straight from Ethiopia. Well, the toasting and the grinding are two things that will like shorten the the, the length of a spice, right? So if somebody's yeah. not doing those. And so basically, they'll they'll be good longer. Is yeah. What I, yeah. So when we toast them and grind them, it does shorten the life a little bit, but it brings out the flavor. It yes. Blooms them. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, any Indian cook would know you always toast your spices. Yes. So that's kind of a big deal. So our mezzo giorno gravy right here is kind of coming to a simmer. And, that looks beautiful. Um, now I want to check my meatballs. And woo! <laughs> These are looking glass. good. Can I get a glass? I want to try our, our wine. I'm our about to mean mug. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so here's our big old meatballs. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> well, don't pick me up. <laughs> I like that we, we put, I think it was Katie, you were editing the recipe, and you yeah. were like, maybe make a note that they're not done yet. And I was oh, like, yeah, yeah. good That's point. Good <laughs> don't point. eat them right now. Like, yeah, they're a little bit underdone, but if I don't know if you can see good. this. They've rendered out yeah. quite a bit of fat, so we're leaving that behind. And a lot of some people don't like lamb because of the fatty lamb well, the fat flavor. Is where the flavor is yeah, flavor. so we're leaving a little bit of it behind. Babies. We talked about the babies. Oh my god! <laughs> it's because they're babies. Peggy, real quick, Peggy asked, uh, she's viewing at home. How can you make a vegetarian version with your spice blend? Ooh. Of meatballs? I've never made a vegetarian version of meatballs. Thank you can't oh. do You're it, amazing. Peggy. <laughs> Eat it some can't meat. be done. <laughs> The name is Meatballs. <laughs> but I imagine you could use um, any of the new meat substitutes. Um, might work, a Ooh. ground meat substitute. As long as vegetarian ball. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> vegetarian ball. Lauren, yeah. right? our Lauren's resident vegan chef. resident vegan chef. So yeah. there's many things that you can make uh, meatless, meatless balls with. Um, so you can use any of the so you can use eggplants, you can use chickpeas and mushrooms are great. I really like to add sun-dried tomatoes into mine to give it like that little mm. bit of more of a meaty texture. Um, and then you need breadcrumb or rice to kind of give really? it body. Yep, pulse it all in a food processor. And of course with your preferred spice, spice blend. What about English muffins soaked in milk? <laughs> can't soak That's what we just did. Milk. Oh, you can't do vegan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they get you. Uh, <laughs> You know, you could do English muffins soaked in nut milk. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you can make a, like, if you d wanted to do, like, a buttermilk, you just add a little apple cider vinegar to that, Ooh. and then it curdles the milk mm -hmm. and turns into a vegan buttermilk. So for those who don't know, Lauren, real quick, introduce yourself. 
I don't want to steal the Just <laughs> They need to know who they're getting their information from. No, okay, all right. I'm Chef Lauren of the Vibrant Veg. So I am a, a vegan chef here in town, and I run a vegan catering business. And she's our Kessenix contact. And I'm also like, the chef here at nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yay. Hey. We, we got Peggy covered. <laughs> so here is our uh, meatballs. They're returned into the gravy. So now, as they simmer another 20 minutes or so, mm. now your sauce is going to get that much more flavorful just because that meat, meat and all that cheese simmering mm -hmm. in there has a lot of cheese in there. Um, so the next step on this journey is to make pasta. Nice. I'm going to do pockery which is kind of like rigatoni, Southern Italian. They're just little um, tubes. Oh, the little kidney, I, re I just really want to like put those these. on my fingers. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I have a pot ring. of salted water back here, and we're gonna boil those up, and we always undercook the pasta just a little bit, okay. because we're gonna finish it in the sauce. Do you wanna set a timer? Does someone wanna set a timer? Do you want? There's, we don't need a timer. All right. <laughs> <laughs> His hand is a tablespoon, yeah. so I think you know. <laughs> I want to know what grapes are in this wine, so I'm just going to look really quick. This is a Lebanese wine from the Becca Valley. That's true. A lot of people, so before we started the live broadcast, like when I started talking, the viewers at home got a nice little video that talked about what this wine <gasps> they is. They did? I didn't get to see the they video. They did. Um, and it really went into detail about this wine and why it was paired with this dish. That is sexy. I love that. So we'll share it with everybody here, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's Cinso Grenache and Cab. So two Rhone grapes and one um, Bordeaux grape. It's Leb Lebanese. Oh. I, I usually really don't like red wine, and I really like this wine. I know, it's crazy. I'm like, give me an IPA and I'm done. But like, I'll drink I some mean, wine every now and then. That is the kind of thing I say about beer. I say, I usually don't like beer, but yeah, this one is mine. I'm the beer equivalent of Lindsay's wine. I mean, or whatever that is. By our powers is. combined, yes. yes. Yeah. So we're gonna get ready to. Get I like some the pasta shape going. of this grater. It's wider than the one I have at home. I wonder if they have one of those here. They probably do. This, this is, place is dangerous. This is another thing at Lombardino's. <laughs> Most people don't know every pasta you get, I'm hand grating cheese over the top. Oh my god. So goodness. this arm is so much stronger than my other arm. It did, yeah, wow. did yeah, you yeah, feel like <laughs> <laughs> So we get. 80 pound wheels of Parmigiano Reggiano from Italy, and we go through one about every three weeks. So I'm grating 80 pounds of cheese every three oh, weeks by hand. Uh, but it just tastes better if you grate it fresh. Same with um, our, uh, <laughs> our dates that we serve stuffed with gorgonzola over finocchio on a salami. The salami's better when you slice it to order. So doing everything to order and using good ingredients is a good key for this. I remember early in the pandemic, I was I was talking to a lot of restaurants about what they were doing, how they were dealing with it, and I, I don't know if I talked to you or to Michael, but like we're like our food doesn't travel well, <laughs> like yeah. it's not like it's not designed for takeout, right? And you can do some pivoting, and restaurants did, but there's a lot of stuff like that where I I really missed restaurant food that felt like yeah. restaurant food, yeah. Yeah, that's yes. that's very true. Like we do a tremendous amount of carryout, and I don't think that's going to go away. I think people are used to it now. I think people they, are. Yeah, no, they really dig it. So, um, and a lot of our pastas and our pizzas travel, but uh, mussels. Yes. The whole thing of mussels, mussels. and cream sauce, kind of strange, salmon, but like, people yeah. order it. Oh. Uh, we did run into a problem with salmon. We did salmon with this really beautiful fall salad with mm -hmm. green apples, and it was really delicious. But then when you put it in a box and it steamed for 10 minutes, it tasted terrible. Oh no. So, and those are the tough lessons we had to learn. This, yeah. what, what's wrong, this tastes great. People are calling and saying, this isn't good. But the apples reacted to the plastic, to the sauce, and to the, oh my and the salmon. Yeah. It just turned out terrible. And you know, it's just, we're learning as we go, some of this, making it up oh along my gosh. the way. Yeah, that sometimes we do that, or we'll run a special or a dessert or something. We'll say we have 24 of these, but they're only available in house. Only, yeah. We don't think they're going to travel very well. But yeah. Uh, yeah, just crazy amounts of carryout, hundreds and hundreds of people. Like some some of the busiest shifts I've ever had were during the pandemic. Yeah. Because we would when we had our patio, we had 12 tables outside. We had limited dining indoors, and we're serving 150 meals out the back door. Yeah. Carryout is crazy. I had people get in touch with me at the Capital Times where I work, asking how to order from Lombardino's. And I was like, guys, I 
think you should call on Bernina. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I love to be helpful, and I will try my best, but I was just like, I, I don't work there. Um, so I'm going to have some meatballs ready in a second oh, yeah. here. Whoop. I will get out of the way. Something, another thing I just love to do, and I'm going to uh, switch this out with my other pot. It's up here for now. <laughs> we use some, color. We, <laughs> voila. We use some of our dried spices in this. Kitchen magic. <laughs> but I also like to combine fresh spices as well, um, our fresh herbs. And so we have our mezzo giorno in the gravy. We have the bomba with the chilies in the meatballs, lots of fennel seed. But I also like a little bit of fresh mint. Oh, yeah. Combined with chili and tomato. It's such a great flavor it looks combination. Torn more than it Yeah, I like to just roughly chop it or tear it. Mm -hmm. And at the restaurant, we have a big mint patch growing outside the back door. And we use it all the time. And it's, it's in the basil family. So it really plays well with Italian and Mediterranean ingredients. I can't grow mint in my own garden because it would be the only thing I grew. Yeah, it takes over, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. Peggy asked, if you aren't using a timer for the pasta, how do you know when it's ready? Like everyone Excellent. Is, I Excellent. mean, every, yeah, this is like. So <laughs> I do this. They're hot. It's not ready. <laughs> it's still hard. <laughs> so I put it chef back hands. <laughs> okay. This is chef hands. Though. I want it really yeah. al dente. Yeah. When it's hard. Yeah. Okay. I, like I want it to be a little al dente, but not all the way. You know. It's like you um, can't throw those ones against the wall. <laughs> no. So. I mean. We, we could. tried once at one. Did we try? I one? feel like we did try throwing pasta. I think did. Do you guys have some small plates? I'll set out some plates of meatballs right away, and then we'll have pasta shortly. Because as we just saw, it's not done yet. It's, it's not it's done still, yet. It's still as too we hard. saw, we've got some time. Um, so. Just a tiny bit. The shades well, of green we can here is turn this oh, all the way off. Oh, okay, good. A lot of St. Patrick's Day spirit. Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, we'll just set these Ruthie brought these here. into the newsroom, so I decided to wear the bling because she, she brought them for all of us. Some of them had like beer symbols and stuff on them. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not wearing that. <laughs> so as I was saying earlier, the, the meatballs in Italy are always served as their own course. And then, mm. um, so you have your meat course and you have your pasta separate. So we'll do a couple of meatballs for everybody, each person here. A little bit of that, little bit of that gravy, and then we're gonna add some sheep's milk feta cheese from France, which is my favorite feta. Is that Valbreso or? Uh, yeah. Like she's here on behalf. Some of the best pecorinos though locally are Landmark Creamery. Really oh, good. Oh yeah. I love their so there's stuff. There's a sheep milk uh, feta that I love from Hidden Springs. Uh huh. Um, excellent sheep milk feta, and I just been recently been having. Um, I've been going to the farmer's market in Garver on Saturday mornings, and the guy from Capri Cheese, uh -huh. it's mostly goat milk, but he does a Greek-style sheet milk feta that's excellent. Really? Mm -hmm. It's not as creamy as this guy, but really good flavor. We need some a little bit of serving here. <laughs> Pass a few of these down. An anonymous attendee, <laughs> uh, they asked, what is your favorite spice blend to cook with? or the most versatile? Ooh. Well, our signature salt is really popular and really versatile. Um, it goes with almost anything from seafood to meat. We love it in green salads. It's really delicious with tarragon and the California citrus in it. But the berberet is pretty much my favorite. I love shakshuka. And I, that, that is really good with I that. I think the questions are beefing up because I let the audience know at home the best question voted on by Lindsay and Patrick tonight is going to take home a bottle of the wine. Oh. So they're coming in. One more from Chris asked, what are some of your favorite aspects of how Italians eat, as in order of dishes, not serving things together, etc.? Oh, yeah. Well, Ooh, I love it. that is a good question. Italians do eat a lot differently. When I first started this restaurant, I had been to Italy once, and now I've been there about 15 times. So I've done a lot of research on how Italians eat, and they don't put everything on a plate together. You're not gonna get sauce, veg, starch, and meat or fish all together. They eat things in courses. I always say it's a civilized way to eat. Small <laughs> portion of pasta, then you'll get a meat or fish. Um, so it's really um, the way the Italians love to eat. So our pasta is done. I'm just gonna toss this. And this is how Italians eat, just in courses. So. Yeah. 
Is that the premium for Condi there? Yep. Oh, yeah. In fact, we're doing the appetizer of the meatballs. So that's going to finish up. Do we need another plate or did everyone get some? I think we're all good. So I like to finish my sauce with just a little butter and then we'll taste it and see it's if it needs good, any. It's very good, Mike. Any, uh... Yay! <laughs> Mm, that's pretty good. That's good. <laughs> so. That butter trick. Yeah, so we do a little butter just at the end, and once the butter has disappeared, we're ready to go. Okay, Dorothy is coming in hot with a good question. I think she wants oh, to she win really the wine. Oh, she really wants the prize, doesn't she? She asked, if you could be a pasta, what would you be? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. It's got to be spaghetti carbonara. Ooh! Actually, bucatini carbonara, because I like bucatini. That's my favorite pasta. Which one? What does that look like? Bucatini is long like spaghetti, but with a hole through it, like oh, a straw dang. almost. There and was that, a whole story about how it was like it no was hard one to find, find any, yeah. any of it. What? It was a great story. I, I have to say, I would be uh, little ears or a Oh, or a nice. Well, I just was, when I was out west, I ran into some Italians and we were having coffee together, talking, and we talked about carbonara. Yes. Yeah. With spaghetti, rigatoni, or with the um, bucatini. And I was telling him, you know, Americans like to put cream in it. In Italy, it's eggs with pecorino cheese and black pepper. And then they use guanciale, which is bacon made from hog jowls, not pancetta. And I said, you know, where I come from, we're in the, uh, you know, we're in the dairy state. We put a little cream in there. And this guy looked at him and he said, put in cream and carbonara. He's like, killing your own father. <laughs> you, you just don't That's do so it. Intense. That's very intense. And back to the but last question, he also said, I'm here traveling the U.S. for uh, two months. I just want a steak with some olive oil and pepper and salt. Why do Americans put so much right. on everything, you know? Yeah. Why, and he said, we don't eat so much garlic. Why do you put so much garlic in everything? Garlic is delicious. And you that was just garlic. the average Italian guy I ran into. I feel into. very judged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, what I've learned about, by traveling to Italy and getting to know some Italians and yeah. having some Italian friends, very opinionated about food. Hmm? Like the food in their village is better than the food in the next village, or <laughs> this region is better than that region. So, mm -hmm. um, so that that goes back to that question about. Um, yeah. It does feel like it's fun because the stakes feel relatively. I mean, to me, low. Like you can disagree about garlic, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what, Martha? <laughs> Oh, pistachio oh. <laughs> I was in Bologna once, yeah. and this Italian guy that came and worked for us at the restaurant, he met us there in his mm -hmm. Badger shirt, and we meet in Bologna, and he said, I'm going to give you a real treat. We're going to get mortadella from Bologna with nice. pistachios. And so we went um, to the butcher, and he asked in Italian, mortadella with pistachios, and I could see the butcher yelling at him. And then he turned to me and said, um, in Bologna, they don't put pistachios in. <laughs> you have to go to a different town to get pistachios. <laughs> so I remember uh, I was talking with Francesco Mangiano, who's uh -huh. a wonderful chef in, of Oster at Osteria Papava. Yep. And he was talking about how when they, he would travel in Italy, you would go over like the border of one county to the next, and all of a sudden they don't put cheese on their... Oh, yeah. What, whatever this, this um, I think it was like a ribolita, like a, like a soup. Uh-huh. Um, they don't put cheese on it anymore. And here they do, and here they don't. And they both feel very strongly about that. Like, <laughs> and, and how it can be almost arbitrary. Yeah. But different regions do things differently. I do think my new goal in life, though, is to say, I was in Bologna once. <laughs> I think I'm aspiring to that now. <laughs> that sounded so cool. Like, it's one time. Here's a little pockery pasta. So now you've gotten the meatballs, and then you have the next course is the pasta with the with the gravy or the ragu that we have. So in Naples, Italy, they would eat in courses like this on a Sunday. So we have to eat all this first. Right? Uh, you know, you, you can mix and match. We have rules about how yeah. you have to eat this. This is the United States. Yeah. I guess we do what we want, right? <laughs> I didn't mention at the top of the video that if you're watching from home and you take pictures, if you're cooking along, make sure to tag the Cap Times on social media, and you can also use the hashtag Cooking with the Cap Times. Here you go. I think we should have enough. Beautiful. Here. So yes. the pockery are little tubes, and then I have the pecorino romano. So yes. southern <laughs> Italian food would have pecorino, the hard sheep's grating cheese, lots of salt in there, um, as opposed to parmesan from the north. 
What? That is just the sauce that the meatballs were simmered in. So you get two courses out of the same dish. Serve the meatballs with a different cheese and some fresh mint, and then save the sauce and serve it with pasta. So you get a couple of meals out of each thing. And the last thing I would do with this, because this is kind of rich and a little bit fatty, we'll have a salad. I love that. Friends of ours in California would do the French thing and they would eat the salad at the end of the meal and I loved huh. it. I love that, like, just do salad later. Yeah. <laughs> and the Italian... Yeah, yeah, in case right? you're full, that's the thing you won't eat. Kind of the Italian way with salad too is to use bitter greens. I love so we that, have yeah. escarole and radicchio, which are bitter. And then we have some sweet butter lettuce and then we have peppery baby arugula. So it's a, a mix. And I remember in 2000 when we opened Lombardino's, we came up with a house pizza with prosciutto and some roasted garlic and arugula. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get arugula in Madison. I was oh, the wow. first guy that called Golden Produce Company and said, I need a steady supply of arugula. And they had to go to Chicago to bring it twice a week because it was we didn't know about arugula. Now you can get it in any grocery store you want. Yeah, I have to say, uh, shout out to Don. I think it's Don's Produce at the, at the Dane County Farmer's Market. They have the most gorgeous greens right now because their greenhouse is cooking. So this, I'm gonna do just a little it. mixture on here of lemon and a little bit of red wine vinegar. So I have this great lemon reamer. I did a cooking class once at Orange Tree Imports. Yeah. And I squeezed a lemon like this and one of the guys in the class said, you know they sell these, you should be promoting what they sell. <laughs> so, but you can use, just use a fork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a little fresh lemon, just a little bit. Come on. This is liberating from the, the emulsification trap. Yeah, a like, little bit of red wine vinegar. You didn't emulsify anything. Why? And then a good glug of olive oil. So they say in Italy that you should be a madman with the olive oil <laughs> and a miser with the vinegar and then a little bit of salt. But in our case, we're going to use our signature salt, tarragon. And this has um, cracked coriander seed. Mm. And it has um, some really nice ocean sea salt. And it's kind of a coarse. Yeah. mixture and then it has the citrus from california and a little bit of black lime is the secret in here uh, fermented lime it's like a persian fermented lime um, and that goes really well together broccoli recently and it was wonderful so i've only had the spices for a few days so i haven't cooked them too much but i did um i did broccoli and oh so good Excellent. you know what i'm just gonna pass this around and let people serve themselves if you'd like a little bit of salad so this would be just a nice end of the meal palate cleanser to go with all that rich Meatball and pasta courses that you've had. And that's what I like that's to cook. It. That's cool. how we eat every day at home. Yeah. You know? <laughs> every day, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you can ask um, my wife or my ex wife. <laughs> I, I don't cook at home. Just like, no. <laughs> I have a beautiful kitchen, but I, I rarely use it. So. <laughs> well, you did during the pandemic, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I did during the pandemic. And actually, during the pandemic, we sold our house. Uh, because our income was just decimated, so and we bought the house next door. Oh wow! Directly okay. next door, and we remodeled it. Oh, wow. So we reduced all our payments, but I got a better kitchen, and I have a wood-fired uh, pizza oven in my kitchen now, and a wow. ten-burner range. So maybe someday you come over, we'll make pizza in my pizza oh, oven. That sounds great. <laughs> and anytime you look at like making pizza at at home, it's always like crank your oven to five hundred fifty yeah. and open yes. all the windows, and you're like, no, <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. Um, I don't know. I hope everyone yeah. enjoyed. Any, any more questions? Are we? No more questions. Um, I picked the winners for the wine. I just figured we were, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't open it up for discussion. But if you were to pick, who would you have picked? Oh, my gosh. I, I thought all the questions were really good. They were all good. If you were a pasta, which one would you be? That was a good one. That was my favorite. I think yeah. that was Dottie, right? I picked Dottie as one of the winners. Dottie. Dottie. Way to go, Dottie. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank, before we wrap up, um, I just want to thank our sponsors once more for helping make this video series possible. Yes. We have our presenting sponsor, Provision Market at Kessenix. Stop by, get some yummy things to eat. Um, March Madness is up, so you got to get oh, the yeah, perfect, right. chips and salsa and the tacos. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we have our new official wine pairing sponsor, Leopold's Book Books Bar Cafe. Stop by, check it out if you haven't yet. And of course, our official kitchen sponsor is Kessenix, and they're our gracious host for the evening. Shout out to Lauren. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's everything. If anybody yeah, didn't get the recipe, uh, <laughs> let me know. I have my email in the Zoom chat, so if you need the recipe, let us know, and I'll send it to people here too. But yeah. yay! Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for thank having you. us. Thank you. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Woo! So good. Ah, Slancha! Happy St. Patrick's Day! Oh my yay. God!